I'll go ahead. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm with Octo, and here at Octo, I coordinate the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network and edit the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management newsletter. Um, we are very pleased to have Simon Hudson uh, with us today, and he's going to be speaking about the impacts of COVID-19 on coastal and marine tourism. He has literally written the book, which uh, a book so out so far about um, coastal marine tourism during the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, he'll tell you more about the book today as well. Um, we are, uh, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, you can ask questions by typing into the chat panel or the question and answer, uh, the Q&A panel. Um, you can send in questions at any point during the webinar. And um, we'll, but we'll hold substantive questions till the end. We'll have about anywhere from a 20 to 40 minutes of presentation and the remaining time will be devoted to questions. Um, and in the chat panel, you are also able to chat with all attendees. Uh, we just ask that you keep it professional, um, uh, any chat that goes on there. So Simon, thank you so much for being here today. And we really appreciate you coming to talk about this. It's a pleasure and thanks very much for the introduction and welcome everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon to you. It's evening here actually. I'm in Portugal in the Algarve where it's a beautiful evening. We're looking at the sunset over the ocean. Um, give you a little bit of background on, on myself, why I'm here actually. I'm, I'm part time now. I, I was ahead of my time. I went virtual last summer. Um, prior to that, I was in uh, University of South Carolina working, uh, running a research centre and the research centre was focused on supporting the tourism industry in South Carolina, um, which was an interesting position. And prior to that, I was in Canada, um, uh, 2000 to 2010, worked at the University of Calgary, um, and going backwards, uh, spent the 90s in England, uh, University of Brighton, which is where I grew up and actually studied there, studied business there back in uh, the 80s, and um, worked a little bit in the travel industry as well. So I have a bit, bit of background in the industry uh, before I moved into academia. Um, I've also worked, um, travel around the world. Um, of course I have to, part of this job. Um, I've worked as a visiting professor all over the place. Uh, particularly favorite was on uh, semester at sea, a floating university that goes around the world. And if there's any oceanographers listening, um, uh, you might want to look at this cause it's, uh, it's an amazing opp opportunity, obviously not running right now, but, uh, so I've written, um, done a lot of research over the years. Um, um, as Sarah mentioned, the latest book is on COVID uh, and COVID-19 and travel and its impact. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So I've got quite a few slides, but I'll run through quite quickly. This is being recorded, so you can always go over it again and or get back to me if you want clarification on any points. What I'm going to talk about is the, the impact that it's had, uh, that the pandemic's had on tourism and, and on coastal and marine tourism in particular, because that's what you're interested in, how this has negatively impacted other coastal sectors and how it slowed down marine, down marine cons conservation. Um, and then I'm going to look at what those in the industry are doing or, or should be doing. I say doing, some are, most aren't, um, to survive because it really is survival right now. And then we're going to take a look at the future. What, what will the future look like for those dependent on marine tourism? So, of course, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. The, the impact of COVID-19 on travel has been significant. And, and what is painfully demonstrated is that travel can play a critical role in the spread of new infectious diseases. I was actually in a ski resort at the time of lockdown in March where infection rates were 20 to 30 times uh, other places. Uh, and that was the same for cruise ships as well. And I, I wrote a, the opening case study in my book about how cruise industry, you know, having done so well over the last five, 10 years, it was growing and growing and growing, how it's become really a symbol of COVID-19. And I think that industry, what, that sector in particular is gonna take a, a long time to come back. Um, and, and, it, and it was ironic that the last semester at sea I taught back in September, October, November, um, we were traveling around Europe, South America, no sign of COVID. And a lot of the talk was about over-tourism. Every research paper that I got to review was about over-tourism. How, how do we deal with all, too many tourists? And we've suddenly gone to, from over-tourism to under-tourism, where for a lot of destinations, over-tourism is, is a fond memory. Uh, and it'll take a long, long time to come back to those levels, 2019 levels of tourism. Um, and, and when you look at the, the industry, the tourism hospitality industry, compared to other sectors, you know, the fact that large gatherings are essential, close 
human interaction is essential. Um, the, the, the fact that it's dependent on business and leisure. Travel industry has been hit far, by far more than uh, many, many other sectors. Uh, and of course, the economic impacts have been huge. And that's what we see a, a lot about in the media. The fact that international tourism arrivals are down by half. The industry's lost $320 billion and counting. $100 million, uh, uh, 100 million jobs are gone. You know, and this really speaks to the, the how dependence so many parts of the world had become perhaps over dependent on tourism. And, and I'll cut, come to that in, in a little bit. But, but it's not just about the economic impacts. We've seen significant social impacts. And I think some of these will dictate how, how we move forward in the travel industry, the way we communicate with each other, whether it's in business or in leisure form, um, what we're doing right now, the anxiety, the stress levels, the, the fact that travelers are going to be so cautious now, move, already are moving forward. Uh, and it'll be a long time before we build that confidence back in tourists. Um, and there's been some positive social outcomes. I've seen a lot of what they call in, in, this, in Canada, care mongering, people getting together to support each other during this pandemic. And that's con there's continuing examples of that. And I'll, I'll give one of those examples later. And then of course, there've been some environmental impacts. You know, we, we, we've seen some positive ones. We've seen empty streets and people saying, well, we quite like this clean air. Uh, a lot of people, you know, bikes sold out all over Europe and people have been active, getting out of the fresh air. Perhaps a renewed appreciation of nature. And I was speaking to a guide in Canada just this week, uh, and he was saying he's seeing a lot more interest from people from big cities, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, desperate to get out of the city, desperate to get out and see nature, uh, and a real new, renewed appreciation. And a lot of demand for survival courses as well, which is a bit scary, but there you go. Um, but what we have seen is, is the ecosystems having a time to breathe. And, and, and it's too early, I think, to tell, maybe some of you are more experts on this, too, to tell whether this is going to have a, a long-term impact on, on our climate, on the ecosystems. But at the moment, you know, what we are seeing, and, and I'll show a, a commercial in a minute from Australia, you know, saying that, hey, this is a good time. We've, we've had time to breathe. We're going to be even better when we come back. Uh, that remains to be seen, and, and I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, but of course, you know, like other, other, every sector of tourism, the, the impact on marine and coastal tourism has been severe because so many coastal areas uh, are, depend on tourism. Uh, Aruba, for example, you know, if you think, you know, all the headlines are about Italy and Spain and France and, you know, they, they, only 10, 15 percent of their GDP is dependent on tourism. In Aruba, it's 85 percent of the GDP is dependent on tourism and 90 percent of those tourists are American. So really, they had no option, you know, uh, out, coming out of lockdown. They had to open up to survive. It was a matter of economic survival. Even as someone told me when I was doing some research for the book, you know, they even had to calculate, well, what is the acceptable level of deaths? How, what is the balance? How, how do we get things going again? Because otherwise, we have no economy whatsoever. And, um, it, you know, and this hasn't just impacted the tourism sector, of course. You know, once you've got, um, once you've got no tourists, I, when I... I was working in Aruba, Aruba a couple of years ago, excuse me, and I was living just on the street back from all the big high-rise hotels. And all these suppliers, you know, the laundries, the liquor, <clears throat> the, uh, liquor stores, clothing, the, you know, everybody supplying the tourism industry. That's all come to a standstill. You know, this picture here is of uh, uh, the fishing economy in Kenya where, you know, there's no demand from hotels because hotels are just not open. So, so many other sectors in, in, in coastal economies have suffered as a trickle down impact from the lack of tourists. And of course, marine conservation is under pressure. You've got examples here like uh, the Tubatu Reefs National Park in the Philippines, where tourism revenues make up half of the conservation budget. And that's similar many other places all over the world. We become so dependent upon tourism income to look after our ecosystems and suddenly that money's not there and and the ecosystems are under threat and this isn't the same this is the same thing in in africa i've heard stories of illegal poaching increasing again because there's no money to uh, uh to help with the security uh and so this is a real issue right now and, and i'll come back to this uh, a little bit later in how we can move on and perhaps make us a little bit more resilient. And, you know, th this whole problem is, it's, it's not new, this whole balance between conservation and tourism. I was in, and I mentioned how I was teaching about over-tourism last year. One of my case studies on this semester at sea was going into Croatia and Dubrovnik, meeting the mayor, taking the students to hear about how 
the mayor there is dealing with over tourism. Uh, you know, there they've had a huge increase in tourists from Game of Thrones tourism and the fact that Dubrovnik has become one of the most popular capital cities in the world. But they need the, they need the money to maintain the, 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 the historic buildings. They're crumbling. And so without the tourists, they have no money for conservation. At the same time, all the residents are moving out and complaining there's too many tourists. And the mayor is saying, well, OK, we'll try and control the tourists. We'll find a balance. But we need to remember, and this was him speaking last September, we need to remember there was a time not that long ago and during the war that there weren't any tourists. And that's what's happening right now. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's a delicate balance between, um, you know, tourism and conservation and something that we're, we're as moving forward, we're going to have to be more sensitive, I think, about um, in terms of how we, how we move forward with sustainable tourism. So, so you know, th th it's had a huge impact on tourism, uh, the pandemic, and it's been fascinating um, observing how the industry has reacted and, and dealt with this. And I'd say that there's three key, key, key actions right now that those in the industry perhaps should be doing to survive. Um, the, the first is what I call COVID adaptability, but really adapting. And it's not just the industry that's having to adapt. We've all had to adapt over the last two, three months in, in, in every aspect of the way we live. And I think that's the same for anybody in, in, in a lot of industries, but certainly the tourism and hospitality sector has to adapt and has to change, even completely pivot business models. This is an example here where a ferry operator in the, in the UK and the South of England wasn't doing much business, there's no tourists, except there was an interest in looking at the cruise ships that are all harboured, uh, anchored offshore because they, they, there's no room for them to harbour anywhere and it's too expensive. And so he set up tours looking around the cruise ships, very innovative, uh, completely pivoting, completely adapting. Uh, you know, and as J.F. Kennedy was fond of saying that crisis has two characters in China. One means a crisis, the other means opportunity. So for some, uh, this will be an opportunity. And I'll come back to that a little bit later when we're talking about um, uh, the future. Uh, just a few other examples of adaptability, COVID adaptability. There's a, an Australian entertainment company that's rolling out lots of driving or, or uh, uh, cr cruising movie theatres all over the States. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. We already are through entertainment, um, driving theatres, driving mu music festivals. And there was a, one of the early adopt, uh, adopters of this kind of uh, social distancing restaurants was in Amsterdam uh, a few years ago, but we're seeing hotels, um, restaurants having to adapt, uh, whether it's on 50% capacity or for social, re social distancing rules, uh, adapt to the new environment. And it, and it is, it, we're not going back to a, a normal, I don't think. So this is adapting to the new normal. And, and for, for many, this, this has meant completely changing target markets. So many countries I've, I've looked at and, and interviewed people from, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Canada, here's an example of Tourism Nova Scotia launching a, a campaign to target domestic tourists because there are no other. Uh, and so if you're going to get tourists, why not um, attract your domestic tourists? And we've seen a lot of other places in Canada. This is a BC, British Columbia targeting Peaks. They're local people. There's a West Coast experience waiting for you. Here, a sense of being connected to something greater runs deeper than the roots of giants. Travel by sea, road, and air, and feel inspired in every sense. Soak up the flavor. Spark your creativity. Connect with cultures shaped over thousands of years. Explore further than you ever have before. It's all here in BC's wild backyard. So where will you go? What will you see? When you explore our West Coast, plan now to explore BC this summer. So it's just one example of a, of a, a destination targeting the locals. And this has happened all over the world, whether it's from Malaysia, where they've seen an increase in demand from marine tourism, or, um, you know, targeting a younger type of tourist. You know, it may not be your domestic tourist. What we've seen in, in most countries, the emergencies of, of young, younger people are less, uh, less cautious. Uh, and there is a name for the, you know, the crisis resistant tourists. And again, your destination might not be used to those tourists, but right now they're probably the all you're going to get. So you have to adapt uh, to their needs and their demands and change perhaps the services you offer. 
um, and incentivize them to spend. You know, a lot of domestic tourists don't spend. That, that, that's a complaint I've heard down here in the Algarve in Portugal. Um, August was very busy with Spanish and Portuguese, but they're not in the bars, they're not in the restaurants, they're not spending the money. So there's a real need to incentivize um, the locals, as uh, this example in Malta, but the UK have done it, Vienna have done it, uh, incentivizing the residents. And, and it's not just the money thing, it's to get people out um, um, and uh, uh, to, to more confident of, of going to restaurants, going to bars, um, exploring a little bit. So, so apart from adapting, I think another key issue is, is keeping open lines of communication. Um, what we saw during the pandemic was, a, you know, 90, as this diagram shows, 93% drop off in advertising spend in travel. And yet we know from research, this is the best time to advertise. You know, you get a lot more, um, your brand's going to be top of mind when the crisis is over. Um, it's, it's, it, advertising is cheaper. Um, and it's very important to, to, to tell a message, keep a message going of corporate responsibility. Um, and yes, so many companies have cut their communication, cut their advertising. Um, really important that, you know, there's, here's some examples of companies that organizations that have spent money on advertising. And of course, getting the right tone of message is very important, but some of these, you know, in Greece and Australia, and I've got a, just a little example of an Australian one, because I, I quite like this, the, the message that they were sending about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about nature uh, having a time to breathe. A funny thing happened on the way home as we closed our doors and explored smaller worlds. We looked out through the window and realised we missed you, maybe more than ever on toast. Now, that may not be true, but we'll tell you what is. Staying connected to mates, it's just what we do. So, look, there's a quokka, roos running amok, furry friends high in trees and green shoots popping up. The fish are on a break from our sun-kissed bits. Whale sharks roaming quietly, our silence, their bliss. What else is going on? Well, the winds are yet sweeter. The grass is getting greener. Uluru is having a rest. The stars are still twinkling. Sun showers are sprinkling. The fruit is getting fat. The views are repainted. The horizon much lighter. There's plenty to like. There's plenty that's brighter. So that's news for now. Stuff that makes you feel better. There's a lot more to share to bring us closer than ever. From us. From us. Well, I think you can always rely on the Australians for some good, um, uh, good commercials. Good. They, they they have to work harder, obviously, to get people to travel to Australia because it's so far to go. But. Uh, I, I've always admired their campaigns. And that one I thought told a, a, an interesting message is, hey, we're, we're all gonna take a break and, and we're gonna be even better and stronger. And that remains to be seen. I'll, I'll come back to that uh, point a little bit later on. And, and other destinations didn't, uh, they may not have come out uh, with commercials, but Faroe Islands, for example, had a, had a virtual experience where you could go from your computer, sit at home and explore the islands. And we saw that with Visit Britain and other destinations where, well, you may not be able to visit right now, but let's show you you know, come over to the UK and we'll show you the Harry Potter uh, sets and this, that, whatever. And then when you can travel, um, we'll be top of mind. And so we saw a lot of that uh, kind of communication. And of course, the tone of messaging was very important. Some people say, well, advertising during the lockdown was simply irresponsible. So it was about sending the right message. And this is British Columbia's tourism industry educating their different uh, partners on the tone of message that needed to be sent out. Um, you know, we're not still... But right now we're still in a little bit of a delicate situation, not a lot of international travel. So it's, it's still focused on domestic travel, but there will be a time next year when we'll be sending out a different message uh, once international travel gets up and running again. Um, and I think during this pandemic, social media has become more important than ever. Um, this, this was a great example with um, Zermatt, very cost effective campaign where they projected the image of different countries flags once a day during the pandemic. Um, and they reached about 700 million people with this campaign. It was a very, relatively cheap campaign. Um, so I think social media has been used by, by the smart organizations during this campaign to get the message out. And I say not just to consumers, but to employees, to stakeholders, investors, etc. So the third, the third key um, uh, uh, factor in survival, I think, is collaboration, whether it's at a country level. And I think we're seeing already 
uh, countries talking to each other, creating travel bubbles. This is an example of what a bubble could look like between New Zealand and Australia. We'll be seeing some in Eastern Europe and we're going to see more and more travel corridors. We have them here in Portugal between certain countries. Um, working together to get things started again. Or it might be just working with uh, different people in your particular sector. This is an example where Scottish Adventure and Marine Tourism operators have got together uh, to get some funding from the government to start getting a message out there, hey, we're open for business, uh, let, let, why don't you come back and experience what we have to offer. And, and also I mentioned about um, care mongering earlier on, this is a great example, I thought a couple of entrepreneurs in Spain put together this My Travel Pledge where if you were a hotel or, or accommodation provider, you could provide free healthcare for health workers and they developed a website so you could go in and uh, offer your accommodation, which was probably empty during the pandemic, the health workers and this generated a lot of publicity and of course generated some uh, goodwill um, amongst customers which was which is very important during this pandemic especially as we come out of it so coming out of it what what do we uh, what will the future look like for those dependent on marine tourism I mean I I don't have a crystal ball I, I think you can look at already you know from a ski industry perspective point of view for example you know you could look at what's happening in, in New Zealand and Australia as they've opened up or tried to open up the ski resource as to what was likely to happen in North America. And I think it's the same for other, uh, uh, other sectors. You can look at examples of, of what's going on. Um, certainly, I think what we're going to see is um, destinations perhaps taking, the, taking a, a step back and, uh, you know, try to press the pause button. I, you know, I mentioned earlier on, there'd been a lot of emphasis on uh, over tourism, a lot of media, a lot of places like Venice here and, and Barcelona, realizing that they just, this, they, they were bursting at the seams and it wasn't sustainable. Um, so this has perhaps been a good time to think about, well, how do we move forward? What do we want? Uh, how can we make uh, tourism more sustainable, more resilient moving forward? And those discussions are taking place, whether or not we, we're mature enough to, to, to work, you know, actually move forward with this, uh, I, I feel sometimes, you know, we'll, once things get back to normal, we'll just open the doors and it'll be back to how it was uh, uh, last year. But we'll see. Certainly, we got, we got destinations. This is Bali, who just announced, actually, they're not opening for tourism until 2021. But there they've realized that, actually, um, maybe tourism isn't everything. Maybe we need to diversify. Maybe we need to... Um, diversify, move up, move into different sectors. And, you know, for a long time now, I've been arguing that destinations over-reliant on tourism need to move away from tourism branding, more to place branding. So becoming a place, uh, attractive place to live, work and play, rather than just an attractive place to play. Because that, as we've seen, um, tourism is so, um, uh, depend well, so over-dependent on tour so tourist destinations that are so over-dependent on tourism, uh, they're vulnerable to uncontrollable factors like this pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, over the years, I, I've done some work. Um, this is one of the projects we did down in Hilton Head, near Hilton Head, Bluffton. But looking at brand development as a place brand, looking to attract people to live, work and play. And just today, there was an article on holiday resorts in the Canary Islands, for example, Canary Islands in Spain, looking to look remote workers, digital nomads. And that, that's what I call myself. I've moved to Portugal because I can. And people... Uh, like myself and even younger people now are choosing to move to places because of the quality of life, not because of a job. They'll work out the job later on. And I think destinations over reliant on tourism need to move away from that. And we've seen again other examples. This is Barbados. You might have heard about this one offering a visa for 12 months. So you can go there, not, not as a tourist, but you can go and live there for 12 months. And it's pretty easy, fill in a form, a little bit of cash bang you there you are and I think we might see a, a, a many more examples of this uh, uh, to, re to replace tourists and I think this is a good thing because it does diversify the economy and it's something I was trying to persuade the Arubans to do when I was down there a couple of years ago um, and, and certainly marine and coastal tourism like other sectors need to more be more resilient you know for many years I remember when I worked in the tourism industry we'd work you know work our butts off for, for months on end um, turn over millions of pounds for that four percent margin it's the margins are so tight you know and, and workers are getting paid so little you know restaurants um it's this pandemic has really shown how fragile the restaurant sector is such tight margins 
that, that a huge percentage of restaurants would never be able to reopen after the pandemic. So we need to be, uh, the industry needs to be more resilient, needs to be stronger. Perhaps more, we need to be attracting more high yield customers uh, as opposed to moving into to mass tourism. And I'll come back to that in a, just in a little bit. Certainly, I think technology will define the future. It, it, years ago, I was writing about, you know, how, you know, Carnival Cruises introduced Bionic Bar on one of their ships as a gimmick, and now it, they've rolled it out on all their ships. And so we're going to see, as we move into a touch-free economy, a lot more use of automation, whether, whether we like it or not. We're also going to see a lot more use of, of uh, like we have here, drones patrolling beaches in Greece. Um, and I think at some point before the vaccine, we're going to be easing travel due to technology because I think there'll be a point where we receive, there'll be instant, instant testing at, at borders, the track and tracing will be a lot more sophisticated. So, and, and I think we're going to see that as uh, we're already seeing it in some parts of the world. And, and as that becomes more sophisticated, again, that means being uh, adaptive in terms of ad adopting this technology. And some people are hes hesitating to do that, but I think technology is going to take us forward as we, as we come out of this. Um, for some of those destinations that have, I, I think, uh, they've done a good job in, in controlling the virus, Vietnam, Taiwan, Portugal, where I am now, I think there could be some kind of halo effect. I think, you know, the perception that these destinations are free, uh, uh, sorry, COVID free or dealt with the virus very well, may, may give them some kind of advantage as we come out of the pandemic. So I think people will more likely to travel there. We've already seen New Zealand move high up on the list of of desired places to travel and move to, um, people buying up private residence over there. So I think there will be some kind of halo, halo effect. And, that, and I think that's a positive thing for some destinations that particularly in, I noticed I did a webinar last week in, in Asia where I felt that the industry was very critical of the government being too focused on health. But I think there could be a silver lining out of that, that they will recover a little bit quicker than those that, that haven't perhaps. Those destinations, unfortunately, those destinations that are reliant, and a lot of them are, uh, coastal destinations reliant on events, whether it's business travel, festivals, uh, concerts, I think they'll have to wait a lot longer. I, I can't see this sec part of this industry coming back. And in fact, from a business travel point of view, it may not come back to how it was ever, ever again. I think we've got used to communicating, working as we are now. Uh, and as we come out of this pandemic, not only are we going to be more cautious of traveling, there'll be less money because we're moving into major recession. Most countries are moving into a major recession. So I think business travel will be one of the first uh, areas to be cut. So again, if you're dependent upon that, uh, you know, a as a destination, you'll need to rethink and pivot and, and target different target market. Um, and I think what's going to happen in the future is, is you know, travelers will have changed. We're, we're not going back to any kind of travel as normal. Um, as this diagram shows, we, we changed our work environment, how we learn, how we communicate, how we shop, how we live and play, our health and well-being, health and, health and wellness is going to be a, a priority as we move forward. And we've, we've of course, we've, we've changed how the way we travel. So it's going to take a while um, uh, for the, to get... Travelers, travelers are going to be cautious. You know, this diagram shows here, you know, half people are going to get back. Yes, we got used to traveling. It's become almost expectant. But I think we're, we're, we're going to be very, very careful, especially the older generation. And, and most of the time, the older generation are the ones that are spending the money. So that, that, the baby boomers are going to take a while to come back and they're going to take their time. Uh, and it's very important for destinations to reassure them that they are, they are safe and the health and safety is a priority. Um, because, as I say, the consumers will prioritise. This will be the number. Safety and security always was a number one motivator, but it will. It will re, consumers will prioritise health and safety. So I think it's important here, as an example of Portugal, having a certificate of clean and safe. And we've seen most countries now adopt some kind of certification standard of, of health and safety, which is which is a good thing. Um, and people want to uh, naturally will want to avoid crowds, and this could be a, a, a positive Im impact for companies like G Adventures who run small trips um, out into the wilderness. But I, I think you know we're, we're going to move away, certainly in the short term, away from mass tourism, and it could be the end of cheap travel. I mean, travel is has in real terms got cheaper over the years. It, it was more expensive to travel in the 70s than it is now. Um, what we might see is travel become go back to how it was, maybe more uh, more for the elite, more expensive. But again, that might be a good thing. If we're attracting a more high yield customer, then we might have more funding to preserve those ecosystems, more funding for conservation. 
Um, and, and I think from a consumer point of view as well, we're going to see a renewed focus on sustainable ethical travel. I, I say renewed, I think, you know, we've had fads of environmentalism and ecotourism and uh, sustainable tourism over the years. And, but I think we're, we, we, what we're going to see out of this is consumers looking for evidence of social responsibility, corporate social responsibility from the companies they travel with. And again, that might be an opportunity for companies and conservation groups to partner and collaborate as they move forward. There was, a, there was an interesting paper that just came out talking about the impact of the pandemic on corporate social responsibility and arguing that as we come out of this, um, those that have a, companies that do address social issues and corporate social responsibility will, will come out of this stronger than others. Um, you know, we will take a note of those companies that, that have looked after us during this pandemic. So it may be an opportunity uh, for partnering. And I know someone threw in a question before this webinar about, you know, conservation moving work forward. How do we protect these ecosystems uh, without the funding that we're getting from tourism? I think as we move forward, we need to move forward, uh, think more about partnerships, collaborating with, um, again, maybe maybe different type of companies we've work, worked with before. You know, and I, I've, I've been arguing for years, I was down in the Canary Islands two years ago, arguing that, that we need to move away from this numbers game, you know, increasing tourism every year, every year, every year. Why don't we move towards my, more high yield? At the time, I was talking about sport tourists because they spend 30% more than normal tourists. But move towards a more high yield, discerning consumer who has more respect for the environment that will fund uh, those conservation efforts. So I think, you know, it, it, just to conclude, the good news, it, it sounds like it's all been bad news. Um, I don't call myself a pessimist, more a realist, but it, the pandemic will fade. It, it um, you know, no, I, I'm a big fan of Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Sapiens and Homo, De Homo Deus. And, you know, he says, when we look, look back on this in a thousand years, historians will just say, it, it's just a blip, it's nothing. Um, I, I think for the travel industry, it's a little bit more than Philip and it's, it's been more like a roadblock. And I think, uh, you know, it'll take some time to come back, but it will recover. Um, it'll, from, in my point of view, I think, I think we're probably looking 2023, 2024 before we get back to any kind of levels we were at 2019 tourism. But I say it, it won't be as normal. It'll be a new normal. So the importance of, is being nimble, uh, being adaptive, make sure you're, 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 you can change as we go through these uncertain times, just, just to survive another year until things do get back to some kind of new normal. So uh, I think this is time for thoughts and questions. Just, just um, we were offering, a, if, you, if you're interested in the book, um, a bit of pl self-plugging here. Uh, there's a 20% discount if you buy direct from the publisher, but it is available on Amazon as well if you're interested. And um, I've already started working on the second edition because it's such a dynamic, area things change every day it, 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 but you know i wrote it because i've been studying tourism for so many years and i knew this was significant and had to be documented but also it um, it, kept, it stopped me from getting bored during the lockdown i'm i'm pretty active and like to keep busy and uh, so it's been it's been an interesting time i must admit for me but um i appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat um i'm i'm open now for questions so i'll do my best to answer them Simon, thank you so much. We have a lot of fabulous questions from people. Um, I, I imagine everyone here has found this professionally and personally interesting. Interest. Um, so I just remind everyone you can send uh, questions in to the chat panel or the question panel. Um, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. So uh, we'll start off with Simon uh, with one. Globally, many are looking for recovery to take us to a different, greener place, not business as usual. You have touched on this, but if tourism does restart, how can it be made more sustainable? How can we reduce numbers at popular places, marine parks, without making these only available to those who can afford high prices, etc.? Is it okay to say that travel might only be for the elite? And I guess uh, so I, I would add to that sort of my thought. So. We talk about uh, tourism being down um, for the next few years, but how do, how do businesses keep it from the numbers from surging again? Yeah, it was, as I mentioned, you know, this was a hot topic before COVID. Um, there, there were already, there was already evidence of uh, flight shaming in, in Sweden and Germany. And there, there was an article the other day about travel shaming now, you know, there was a, 
a recognition that just the very fact of getting on an airplane does as much damage to the environment as, as a whole year of eating sustainably or living sustainably. So uh, just one long haul flight. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, this isn't new. And I, and I mentioned, you know, when I was in Dubrovnik where the mayor of Dubrovnik, you know, and he'd received a lot of criticism from both parties, from both conservationists and from the industry on his approach. But, you know, he, he, he operates his, the city is a UNESCO, UNESCO site. So it has to be open to all. It's not just for the elite or the wealthy. Um, and, it, and it's all about a balancing fact. And, you know, and he, he's in fact, because of his efforts to, you know, for example, he was limiting cruise ships to, I think it was two or three a day, which, you know, before that they would just come in, there'd be 10, 12 cruise ships. And he was getting a lot of criticism for that, but because of his efforts, he was being invited to speak around the world about, um, sustainability and how to find this balance and control tourism and it's it's about having a smart attitude um uh, 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 but but as you said whether whether we're smart enough um as human beings i'm not so sure i'm a little bit more cynical in that um, often it's the bottom line that counts um you know, I hope that, you know, we, we, over the year, you know, I got into tourism education at the very early stage, uh, back in the early nineties before, you know, when it just became a, a, a degree subject. And I, you know, hopefully we're seeing more and more leaders and managers, um, being educated in, in issues such as sustainability and environmentalism. And, and the fact that we, we, it's, you know, when I worked in tour operating in the eighties, it was a use up and move on attitude and they admitted it tour operators. Well, We've, we've used up that place, Dominican, we'll move on to wherever. Um, I think there's a recognition that we can't do that anymore. Uh, and, and the consumers are a little bit, as I mentioned, they're more educated now. And, and coming out of this, I think there's going to be an emphasis on ethics, corporate social responsibility. So this may be an opportunity. I don't know. It, it, you know, it, it's too early to tell. I, uh, Bruce Poon Tip from G Adventures wrote a wrote a good book uh, uh, during the pandemic about how we might need to. This might be an opportunity to completely pivot and change our attitude towards travel. Um, we'll see. We'll see where we where, where that goes. I'd like to think that that might be the case. That we this is a time to um, reassess. Um, but whether destinations, you know, remember that, that particularly de destinations over dependent upon tourism, they're desperate for the money right now. So are they going to limit uh, numbers once we open up again? I'm not so sure. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, a question that came in early. Um, I'm curious what the balance is between ecosystems that have been allowed to breathe and those which have been overrun. And I'm assuming they're talking about during the pandemic. Um, I keep hearing stories about parks in the US which are overwhelmed with visitors who don't have many other options for entertainment these days. Are you able to characterize like what places are, are the ecosystems are sort of suffering from the pandemic and those who have had a chance to recuperate possibly? I don't, I, do you know, I, I'm not so sure. I, I couldn't, when I was writing the book, there, there wasn't a lot of evidence out there in either way. Um, you know, what I did see though was, which may be a positive outcome is as you just said, an increasing use of national parks, wilderness areas, um, people realizing what they had in their own backyards. You know, the, the commercial I showed at, at British Columbia, pretty much telling locals, hey, you don't need to go abroad. Why, why do you go to uh, London and Paris? You, you have these amazing, which to do, I, I still think British Columbia is the nicest uh, part of the world I, I've been to. I've traveled so many different places in the world. And yet, you know, most, when I lived there in, in Canada, you know, everybody would be flying off to Europe, knock it off the list, or oh, got to go there, got to go to Italy. Um, maybe this is a realization of what we have in our own backyard. And that might be a good thing in terms of uh, visitor numbers and conservation efforts, because a lot of these places, most of them rely on the tourism income for the conservation, to, for the, uh, to maintain the parks. And so, it, 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 this, this whole education we're going through right now as consumers uh, about the wilderness. And, you know, the, the, the guide I spoke to last week in Canada who runs um, uh, 
uh, guiding trips up in Jasper area uh, in Alberta. He was saying that what he has found with the domestic travel is, is they, they, they don't bother the animals just as, as much as the international travelers. They're not getting out and poking them and feeding them and taking photographs every five minutes because it's, they, they, they've lived there all their lives. They're still fascinating. They're still having an amazing time, um, but it's less impact on the environment. Um, so perhaps, you know, it, it, but again, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so it, it's, I th but I do think generally it's probably a little bit too early to tell. The, the Aussie ad that we saw, I mean, it's an advert, it's a commercial. Um, yeah, our, our country is going to be even more pristine and beautiful when you come back later um, and destroy it. I, you know, but who knows? I, it's a difficult one to ask, answer. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Uh, let's see. Would you kindly comment on how we should prepare personnel to cater and manage coastal tourism in the new normal? There are definitely new skills that need to be explored. Yeah, someone asked me this question. I, uh, a few weeks ago, I was doing a webinar for um, our College of Hospitality and Retail Sport Management back at uh, University of South Carolina. We, they were asking me about should we be changing our curriculum and yet of, it was a definite course we should you know and in fact i'm getting papers to review every week for journals and if they don't mention covid i i reject them straight off it's we, we this this is a completely you know we keep using this word unprecedented but we we don't we haven't been through anything like this especially younger people uh you know i've been through a couple of recessions but this is, you know, they're already saying this is five to eight times worse than the 2008 recession for our industry. Um, so certainly it will need new skills, both, um, you know, for our students, but also as they move, move into managerial um, and, and leadership roles. Particularly, and I mentioned this earlier about this need to be flexible and adaptable. Um, a really, that's going to be the key. And if I'm an employer in the industry right now, that's what I'm looking for in, in, in my staff. Last year, ironically, we just finished a, a big report in South Carolina. It was the last report I, I did for the industry. It was on workforce development. And, and because at the time we had a critical shortage uh, of staff getting people in, into the industry because a lot of the reasons, because it's so lowly paid, but they couldn't see a progression. They couldn't see how they were gonna make a career out of it. And so we looked at all these issues. And of course, you know, now um, there's, there are no jobs. Um, so it's, it's really, really important to be flexible, to be adaptable so that you can take your skills to perhaps to another sector. Um, but also I think, and I mentioned the importance of technology and, and again, you know, five years ago, when people would ask me, well, what's impacting our industry more than ever? I might say, well, sustainability or the environment or um, some other factor. But technology, the last five years has been the number, it's been the top of my list. And, and what this pandemic has done is accelerated the use of technology. And it's made us realize in our industry, but not in other industries, what is out there. You know, just the platform we're using Right now, had we have we heard of Zoom a year ago? I certainly hadn't. Companies now worth more than five of the biggest airlines in the world put together. You know, it, it's it's phenomenal how what 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 good technology is out there. And I've spoken to a lot of conference organisers that have said, well, we didn't realise what was there, but now we know. We're not going to go back to face to face. We might do a little bit, but we we we've adapted. We've changed. So I think the need to adapt, the need to understand technology is very very important. But it is is going to take leadership skill, different skills. I've I've just started uh, a leadership course in a, for the University of Aruba. And it's an MBA course, and I was sent the textbook last year that I was going to use, and it's almost it's it's I'm not throwing it out the window, but. Um, I'm having to adapt my own course material as I, you know, as I, as I go through the course itself because it's changing every day. Um, things are changing every day, and um, you know what we are has the pandemic has showed is we we need strong leadership. That's for sure in, in our industry, but but right through government levels and strong, consistent leadership, consistent decision making. Um, and one thing I I, I did find in the book is that. 
um, women leaders have done particularly well during this pandemic, which again, there's a lot of theories as to why and why not, and I haven't got the time to go into that, but, but um, yeah, in answer to your question in short, definitely, the, the, this, this pandemic will need different skills, and I think we're just starting to understand those right now, but the key ones for me are uh, the importance of adopting technology and being flexible, being ready to adapt or completely pivot. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, I think a big question for a lot of the people on, it's come up in different forms. Um, so there's been a lot of talk uh, internationally about the chance to restructure tourism after the collapse. Uh, how do we do this and what kind of tourism product do we envisage so as to continue to bring in adequate revenues for conservation, especially in the place like Seychelles where tourism is already mostly high end, but now there's none. Um, what kind of restructuring, marketing, and personnel do we need for a new form of tourism? And where can we as conservation organizations leverage the money and expertise for this? Well, uh, yeah, I, it, the, as I mentioned, be, even before COVID, what, what we were seeing with, with tourism was an increased um, desire for experiences. You know, we moved away from you know, the sun, sea, sand, uh, holiday of the, the 90s, 2000. People are pretty experienced, especially those that travel regularly, pretty experienced travelers. They're, they're no longer looking, you know, when I grew up it, it, as a kid, is it, the question was, are you going on holiday? And then when I got into my teens and 20s, it was, well, where are you going on holiday? And then now these days, it's a, what are you doing? What, what have you accomplishing? What are you bringing? What's going to transform your life even? Um, so travel was becoming more and more customized, more personalized, more high end, um, high yield. I think that'll come back. Um, so even, you know, destinations like the Seychelles, yes, there'll be a pause, but that type of travel will come back. There'll be even more demand for that. Um, you know, I, smoke, I spoke to a lot of high-end companies uh, when I was researching for them, but one of the companies I profiled was Mikato Safaris, and they were pretty confident. And, you know, their, their average customers spending $25,000, $30,000, they're pretty confident they, they'll be coming back um, and, and strong, even stronger than before, because there will be that demand. Um, you know, there's a lot of pent-up demand, of course, right now. But, but even as we come out of the pandemic, there's gonna be demand for um, unique, wild open spaces, unique experiences. Like I said in one of the slides, you know, is, is this the end of mass tourism? You know, because we've got all the flight shaming, uh, the charter flights, um, you know, unless the, the airline industry comes up, and they, and they will, um, because they'll come up with a, with a more sustainable way to travel, but they haven't needed to yet. I think it's a bit like car engine. I don't know, I don't know the one end of a car engine from another, but I'm pretty sure that the car manufacturers could, up, could have come up with a much more sustainable way of, of, tra of making a vehicle than they have done, but they just haven't needed to so far. Um, so, the, so the airline industry will have to adapt to that, that new desire, that new consumer uh, desire. Because as I say, as we come out of this, the consumer will have changed. So I think in a, in a, in a in a positive way, this is an opportunity to restructure. Um, and, and, and I've been saying to destinations for, for many years, you know, move, move away from this high numbers game, you know, more and more tourists, more and more money. Think about high yield, think about sustainability, think about where you want to be as a destination in five years, 10 years, 20 years time. Then sit down and, and, and craft you know, craft that vision around that, and then then a strategy, then your marketing strategy, um, and and maybe this is the as I say, this is the time for destinations to do that. But it it, it might just be the smart destinations, that, um, and and that's where education is important, where we need to uh, be educating destinations on on the right way of, of moving forward. I mean, I mean that was a you know it it, it was a big question. I I it, it, you could have you could spend a week. Uh, debating that and it's certainly something we we've discussed in our <clears throat> academic circles and prior to COVID. Um, the, the, COVID has given us an opportunity to, to talk about it. As I say it's just whether we whether we as uh, as an industry follow through um, whether we really do take this seriously or whether we'll you know 
get a vaccine next year. Oh, great. Let's open the doors again, back to normal. Oh, more over tourism. We'll see. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, there's a question. Travelers will take time to come back and consumer attitudes will change, no doubt. But what about host communities? In the Pacific Islands, one of the questions is, when will communities be willing to welcome back tourism? How do we develop new tools and approaches to understand community attitudes? How do we pivot towards a more community-centric marine tourism? Yeah, and again, these questions were coming up prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I, I remember just listening, and it was a few years ago to um, CBB, leader of the CBB for Savannah down in Georgia in the US. And she was saying that the, they noticed that the experience of the consumer was deteriorating, the traveler, because all the residents have moved out. All the residents have moved out because they could rent their accommodations to uh, through Airbnb and get a lot more money and it was too crowded and there were too many tourists and so they moved out and that was the same in Dubrovnik it was the same in many cities um, uh, high, high, highly populated tourism areas before COVID-19 and so there was always uh, there was already a hostility and what she was saying that in Savannah is they'd actually had to therefore limit the number of Airbnbs and try and tempt the residents back because they wanted a more community um, you know, tourists were saying, well, we, we don't want to come anywhere that come here. It's, it's like Disneyland. We want to meet residents. We want to talk to the locals. Um, we want to interact. We want, you know, and again, people, consumers today want authentic interactions. Um, and, and so it, it's finding that balance. And, and uh, you know, uh, um, when you look at developing countries, um, it's something like 45 out of 50 of the least developed countries in the world now have tourism as their number one or number two economic en engine. It's pretty high up there. And tourists are going to these developing countries because of the authenticity. Um, so you need the residents on site. If you don't have happy residents, you won't have happy tourists. And again, we've, we've only just come around to realizing that. I say only just in the last 10, 15 years, realizing that without um, without involving the residents. And I mentioned that project we did in Bluffton near Hilton Head. What we did, they asked us to do the research behind creating a new place brand. And what we did, instead of going, instead of going to the, the leaders and the marketing people and developing a top-down brand, which is what normally happens, um, we went to the people. So we invited people to focus groups, to charrettes, individual interviews. We were down there for about a month. We rented a place. We just talked to the people. We said to them, you know, imagine this place living here in five, 10, 50 years time. What do you want it to look like? And they said, they were, we want pedestrianization. We want to hear the birds. We want wildlife. We want um, good restaurants. We want some varied industry, some high tech. There's a, anyway, they told us what they wanted. And so they crafted the brand based on that. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Normally, you know, around the world, we create these marketing campaigns, these branding campaigns, just to bring in more tourists. Um, and we don't often ask the residents what they think. You know, I can remember when Australia first went advertising to the world and said, this is what we are. You know, Australia was one of the first countries to see tourism as a brand, um, as a destination, as a brand. But the people were pretty angry and they said, well, look, you, how, how are you depicting us? We're, we're more than that. We're more sophisticated than the kangaroos you're putting in your ads and the, uh, the outback and this and that, whatever. And, and so it's very, very important to involve residents and communities. So as we come out of this pandemic, you know, this is an opportunity to go and talk to, to the residents, to those people, particularly those that are dependent upon tourism and say, well, what, what do you want? As, as I mentioned in Bali, they're finding that well, some of those people that are, have been involved in tourism for so many years are saying, well, perhaps it's not something I want to be involved with. It's, you know, it's very poorly paid. Um, if, I'm a, if I run a business, you know, the margins are really, really tight. Um, fixed costs are high. I'm so um, over-dependent and, and I'm so vulnerable to, and it's not just COVID. We, we'll have other, um, not pandemics, but we'll have other uncontrollable events, you know, whether it's... Um, uh, exchange rates um, changing, whether it's um, 
uh, tsunamis. And so we have to be more resilient. So it, it, it may be, as I say, well, going back to the original question, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a loaded question and there's so much we could talk about, but one thing we have realized as, as researchers, and I think the industry as well, without happy residents, you don't have happy tourists, full stop. So it's very, very important to involve residents from the bottom up. And, and if we haven't done before uh, the pandemic, maybe this is the time to go out and talk to them. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, this is fabulous. And there's actually a lot of great uh, discussion in the chat as well. Um, and we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel as though I'm not really yeah. answering these questions. There, there's probably people <laughs> in the audience that could uh, nail these ones. So maybe uh, I'm glad there's some chat going on. I, I haven't got in front of me, but um, because they're, they're great questions and you could have a seminar on each one of those. Exactly. <laughs> well, some of the, que the, the great discussion is more, qu yet more questions. Um, but I was just going to tell everyone, uh, maybe these are, th we'll see if, if these are things we can follow up in, in, in future webinars um, and, and discussion forums. Um, we have a couple more minutes, um, so we'll tackle a couple more questions, Simon, um, but there's, there's a lot more out there. Um, let's see, do you anticipate any regional differences in the recovery of marine tourism? For example, would tourism in colder climates like Alaska have some advantages over tourism in more tropical climates or the other way around or any other regional distinctions? Um. Hard to tell. I, I think a lot depends on the pandemic. A lot depends upon, you know, like we're, we're seeing, you know, I mentioned Vietnam earlier and they were, you know, to me, they were a fascinating case study because population of 96 odd people um, on the border of China, there was no reason that they, they should have somehow avoided this pandemic. And yes, and yet they've had very few cases. I think one death. Um, and that was very recent. Um, and, and a lot of it, I think, is because they just did such a good job locking down. The people were very respectful, obedient uh, of, of the regulations. Uh, you know, and it has been criticism in some of those countries that they were too severe. But I, but I do feel that those countries might benefit more. So, you know, in terms of their coastal or marine tourism in those, those countries that have... Um, have been or generally perceived as, as safe or COVID free will bounce back a little bit quicker. Um, so whether, and that's nothing to do with the climate change. I think it's, it's in terms of how they've dealt well with the virus. Uh, um, in terms of climate, I, I, I'm not so sure. Um, again, that might be, it, it might, we might find consumers, you know, desperate being locked up for so long, desperate to not, you know, they, even before COVID, there was this phrase, I don't know if you've heard of it, last chance tourism, but people were going to the Arctic and Antarctic, you know, before the polar bears all disappear or going to visit the orangutans in Malaysia before we, we kill them all. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an, a morbid type of tourism, but there was definitely uh, a quick, let, let's get there before. Um, so we might see some of that as we come out of this pandemic. We might see more as people have been locked down uh, um, they got it, you know, they still got these bucket lists, uh, desperate to get out there. Um, and, and so those type of destinations might recover a little bit quicker. Um, but, but at the moment, it's hard to tell. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, and, 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 and going back to, going back to, I'm just gonna turn the lights on behind me, just so, going back to that question about um, uh, the community, going back to the, my point I made about communication, that's even worse, isn't it? Um, my point about communications, you know, I, th I think destinations will have to work really, really hard um, to, to win the consumer confidence. So those that put on, you know, really good marketing campaigns, um, really talk to the consumer uh, in a responsible way, send the right tone of message, they're likely to, to recover quicker than others, for sure. I, certainly, you don't want to be keeping quiet during this pandemic. Uh, as an operator or, or a destination. It's very, very important to be uh, communicating with all your stakeholders. Okay, thank you, Simon. I have three last questions I wanna ask, but I'm trying to figure out what they'll be, uh, which one I pick. Um, 
but just real quick, are there any case studies from uh, conservation projects, terrestrial, terrestrial or marine, um, of, of groups doing innovative things um, short term to bring in revenues? Uh, I mean, they're suffering, the conservation projects, marine protected areas, they're suffering devastating losses, their staff and inability to uh, monitor and, and stop poachers. Um, have you seen any innovative short-term things? I mean, we're talking about long-term changes and what we want to see in the future. Have you seen anything for the you know, next six months to a year? Well, or so? Not really in the marine. I, you know, I wrote about a couple of cases in the book, other, other sectors. You know, I mentioned Mikato Safaris, who teamed up with a, uh, a, a company back in Kenya to, to distribute, help manufacture and distribute masks um, uh, you know, and, and keep the money flowing into the community for conservation efforts, etc. Um, you know, and, and I think I've heard some stories of destinations um, trying to involve locals in preservation and conservation. Uh, you know, again, maybe those locals that might normally in their holidays have been flying off, you know, to visit friends and relatives or going down to Mexico or Caribbean. Um, and so bringing them on board and educating them about the importance of conservation and the importance of what's in their backyard, but no specific cases. No, I can't think of any at the top of my head, certainly related to marine tourism. I'm sure there are some, but I can't okay. think of any. Okay. If you have any great cases from terrestrial, I mean, we'd be interested in hearing those too, if they're yeah. adaptable. Um, to, if you don't mind, would do you mind going a couple of minutes over? Uh, two more questions. No. Oh, that will hit. Um, one, uh, a lot of recent tourism was driven by uh, uh, tourists from, from China. Are you seeing attitudes in China change towards uh, international tourism or even domestic tourism? Um, attitudes in China. Um, I, I've, I've seen the other way. Um, I think, you know, China's going to have to work hard to recover from the stigma right or wrong of, of, of where this virus started, you know, and, and ch tourism in China was exploding before COVID-19 and, 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 you know, it's, it's, they've become the biggest travelers in the world and the, and the, the most popular destination in the world. Um, I, I think in terms of travel to China, there'll be a little bit slow down there. It, it'll take longer to recover. But I hear within China, um, tourism is domestic tourism is, is booming right now. Um, so I, you know, because the Chinese, you know, they can't travel internationally. Um, again, I think it's probably too early to tell whether, um, you know, in terms of attitudes towards the Chinese and, and vice versa, whether that's going to impact tourism. I'm sure it will. Um, and again, it, it'll be a way, you know, perception is reality. So it's all about changing perceptions. Uh, you know, and that I've, I've worked, done some work in the past upon, you know, how, how you recover from a crisis as a tourism destination. And, you know, that's what a lot of countries now are going to have to think about is how do we put this straight? Um, our reputation has gone down, rightly or wrongly. Um, you know, and, and it, yeah, it's, it's going to be, I mean, Americans, um, America relies, you know, billions of dollars on international travel coming into the States. Um, the Americans themselves spent over $150 billion last year internationally. That, that money's gone. It's, it's, it's not happening this year. Um, and it's going to be a slow recovery. But to answer your question, no. I, I, I did a politician. I evaded that one. So. Um, one last question. As, as, as groups develop safety protocols, uh, like the hygiene, and in order to attract people back, how do we avoid, like, vast increases in plastic pollution like there's been discussion of hygiene theater since we're sort of learning that uh COVID is not really spread um generally by contact and yet a lot of the uh, hygiene measures sanitation measures involve copious amounts of plastic um how can tourist destinations avoid that yeah that's a good point I, a good question again i don't have an answer i i, I but i have seen this topic um, in the media of late, and, and, it, and it raised my awareness. I mean, I, to be honest, I, until um, I, I went on semester at sea and was listening to some of the oceanographers, I wasn't aware of the, 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 the dreadful plastic pollution around the world. And yes, it does seem to have been exacerbated in one way, 
um, because of these extra hygiene measures and, as you say, increased use of plastics. But on the other hand, there may be a balance that we're not, because we're not traveling as much, uh, there's not so much uh, pollution. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. I, I think, again, it's education. I, I think, I, as I say, I've seen um, a lot more about it. And as we, you know, I, I mentioned about the airlines being um, uh, polluting um, earlier on. And it always astonishes me still that people are not aware of that. You know, people that, that travel regularly just don't even think about it. They think that they go on an eco trip to Costa Rica. They don't think about the flight being a, a slight problem. And I think, again, it'll be the same with the plastics and, and the hygiene measures. People may not be aware of it. Uh, and so it's up to, again, it's up to uh, us to educate them uh, about that. But I don't know the, um, I don't know the answer to that one. Okay. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, and thank you, everyone who was able to attend. Um, this was, fa it was, it was so interesting. I mean, I got a ton out of it, Simon, and um, I just, there was great uh, participation in the chat and lots of great perspectives and shared. Um, so thank you everyone for doing this and, and especially Simon for uh, being willing to come outside of, of business hours and come speak to us. Um, oh, it, was a it was a pleasure and I, I appreciate you giving me the time and um, yeah, if I can answer any other questions, then my email's there. So just, just send me an email. Uh, okay. I'm gonna try. Okay. You, you, we'll probably hear from people. All right. Thank you everyone. And we hope to see you in future webinars. I hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you very much.